Okay, so yeah, unfortunately, I, I forgot to bring my pen with me, so I cannot write on the electric board. I guess I will need to use the blackboard on in the classroom instead. So let me so let me change my background. Give me one second, I, I, I'll get a mark.
I'm the I'm, I'm GE oh, okay. So I'm also so I'm doing soccer practice and other stuff like that this semester. So yeah. yeah. I'm just I just there's other stuff I have to do because I have to do stuff with both sides. There's the yeah, end of the heat, so it's like I'm not sure if you guys can see it clearly. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, I'll try to make it. As big as possible. Yeah, so the the midterm has been grateful midterm has been posted, and I think uh, most of you did a very good job. Um, so if you want the exam paper, you can uh, pick it up in my office after the lecture. And here I will just very briefly talk about the last one. Okay. So we are looking at uh, this correlation uh, function x y uh, t, which is defined as uh, it looks very similar to the convolution. So it's x t plus tau y y tau t tau. Uh, we are integrating over tau. But here we are looking at a t. So this is this is in uh, this denotes the correlation between signal x and y at a particular time t. Now, how do we understand visually? So you have this y tau. You have a signal y. So this is the y tau. And this is the tau axis. So this is the time axis. <coughs> but for x, but this is different from uh, convolution. In convolution, we have, if we do, um, Y convolution with X T and that is X T minus tau Y tau and T tau. So, so the difference is that we have T plus tau here instead of T minus tau. So we start the x t plus tau is actually simpler than x t minus tau. We we just need to start from x tau and shift it to the left by t units. Right? So it's x tau plus t. So we are now suppose this is x. Suppose this is x. So 
x t x tau plus t is basically we're taking x tau and shift it to the left by t units. So compared to the convolution, right? We don't we don't need to do the time reversal. Uh, before we shift the signal X left and right. So the intuition for this co uh, correlation is very straightforward. You have a signal Y, you have a signal X. You want to fix one, fix one of them. For example, you want to fix the Y and shift X, the signal X from left to right and see at which point, at which location they have the maximum correlation. So this T denotes the shift, time shift for the signal X. And then for every time, uh, time shift T, you calculate the point wise correlation between signal Y and the shifted signal X. So this is uh, basically the correlation function. Now convolution is very different, right? You need to, for the X part, you need to reverse it first and then shift it. So they look very similar, but, but you see that the correlation is very intuitive. You have two signals, you want to match their pattern. So you, you shift, you fix one of them and shift the other one and see at which location uh, they have the most similar pattern. But convolution is very different. We derive this special convolution operator from the perspective of uh, linear and time invariant systems. So these two, although they look very similar, they are, but they are derived from very completely different uh, perspectives. Okay, so the, so the first question is to look at, um, the relation between my x, y, t and phi, y, x, t. So we have phi, x, y, t here. So phi, y, x, t. Now by definition is y, t plus tau, uh, x tau, t tau. And we can see that in the phi x y we have x t plus tau y tau. In phi y x we have y t plus tau x tau. So it looks like the the variables inside this x and y signals they are uh, switched. So a very natural uh, idea is to do a change of variable. So we want to change. For example, we want to change. Uh, yt plus tau here into y tau. So we do a change of variable. We can define, uh, let's say, define tau prime as t plus tau. So that equivalently we have tau is tau prime. Minus t. Okay, with this change of variable, we can rewrite this integration. So t plus tau is now tau prime. And this tau is tau prime minus t. Okay, and then d tau from this equation, right? d tau equals to d tau prime. So they are the same. Okay. And now once we have this one, we can compare, we can compare this integration. So this is the equivalent expression for y phi y x t. We can compare this integration with phi x y t. And you can see that they are uh, this is so y tau prime, we have y tau here, they are equal. Here we have x tau prime minus t. Here we have x tau plus t. 
So basically, this is phi by comparison to phi x y negative p. Okay, so the only difference is that here we have p, here we have negative p. And this t is basically the time variable for this correlation function. So, so with that, we have here we have negative p. So basically, this, this equals to phi x y negative p. So phi, so in, in summary, phi y x t is phi x y is a time reversal of phi x y. So they are not equivalent. Uh, in convolution, we, we know that y convolution with x equals x convolution with y. They are commutative. But for the co correlation function, they are not. They are not. So this is part A. And uh, part B and C are very similar. So you follow basically, uh, once we have part A, part B is very simple. Uh, we are looking at the odd part of phi x x. Uh, from part A, from part A, you know that phi x x t is phi. So you you can set x equal to y in the part from the result, uh, in the result obtained from the part A. So you you essentially have that phi x x t equals to phi x x negative t. Could you move the camera down just a little bit? Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. So you have that phi x x t equals to phi x x negative t by setting x equal to y in a in part a. And this already tells you that phi x x is a even function. That is the definition of even, even function, which means phi x x is even. Now, if, if phi x x is even, the all part must be zero. So the all part is zero. And part C, uh, so part C, you follow the same idea. Uh, uh, in, as that in part A. So, we are looking at um, so yt. is a shifted version of signal X. So we want to express phi x, y in terms of phi x, x. So in this case, first of all, phi x, x, t is by definition is this one. And now phi x y t. So phi x y t is here, but now y y t is a shifted version of x. So we need to replace y tau uh, by x. So y tau is x tau plus capital T. And in order to match these two integrations, so you, you can see they, they all depend on X only. So we just need to do a change of variable. Um, so we can, now we can do this one. Yeah, we need, we, we need to unify these two. So we do a change of variable with tau, so tau prime is tau plus capital T, well tau is tau prime minus capital T. So with this one we have, okay, so tau is tau prime minus T, so the first one becomes T plus 
tau prime minus t. Write it in tau prime plus t minus t. Okay, so this is the first one. Now the second one, tau plus capital T is tau prime, so we have tau prime. And t tau prime. Then compare this with by with this integration for phi xx, we can see that you know, this now this part is the same. The only difference is that here we have tau plus t. So t is the time variable for the phi xx function. But here we have tau prime plus you know, t minus capital T. So which is basically means that meaning that this is phi xx at t minus capital T. Okay. <clears throat> so it's a change of variable uh, for, the, for the integration. And similarly for phi yx, you can follow the same steps. I think you will have phi xx t plus capital T step. So this is for part C. Yeah, so this problem is about you know introducing this definition of correlation and and then everything is about integration change of variable. Okay, so are there other questions regarding the in term? I guess we can discuss them uh, in the office hours. Okay, let me let me start sharing my screen. Okay, so uh, today we are going to start lecture five. Uh, here we talk about Fourier series for periodic signals. In the in the next lecture, we go to the Fourier transform. And this is a recap of the some of the concepts that we introduced in the last lecture. Well, we talk about eigen eigen uh, functions of an LTS system. So for for a linear system A matrix A, we know that for this matrix we can define the eigenvectors and eigenvalues such that this equation is satisfied. So when we pass a discrete signal x k or you can you can imagine x k is a in general x k is a vector you can treat it as a discrete time signal you pass this signal to the uh, lts system linear system a so the output is a x now if the output of the system is a scaled version of the input then we say that this signal is a eigen signal or eigen vector of the system and the corresponding scaling factor lambda k is defined as the eigenvalue. Now, if this holds, now instead, if we are looking at a linear combination of eigen uh, vectors, so y is a linear combination of all the eigen vectors at k. So in this case, now we can feed this y into the same system. So we have the output is a times y, but this, now this y is a linear combination of these eigenvectors. So we can distribute the linear combination. So this by linearity of the system, uh, this is equivalent to passing each individual eigen signals to the system and then linearly combine their outputs. So in the end, we can see that the output is also a linear combination of the original outputs for each individual signal. So we can apply this, this, uh, these lines of analysis to the LTS system. So in this, in this uh, lecture, we will introduce, start to introduce the frequency domain descriptions of signals and systems. 
And we start from um, the concepts of eigenfunctions of linear time invariant system. And then we can, we can define the Fourier series for uh, periodic signals. So we have, we have shown this lecture slides uh, in the last lecture. Well, basically for LTI systems, we can, we know that all complex exponential signals taking this form, all these signals are eigenfunctions or eigensignals of the LTI system. In the sense that if you feed these type of signals to an LTI system and, and then by the convolution formula, you can see that the output signal can be written as a, a scaled input. So it's basically the input signal, signal scaled by certain uh, frequency response. So this capital HS is called the, the response of the system at this particular frequency S. Now here, this S can be, a gen, can be generally a complex number. So this is how we calculate this uh, response. It's basically the integration of H tau. So H tau is the impulse response of the LTI system. It's integration of H tau times this exponential uh, scaled by this exponential signal and then integrate over tau. So once we are given the impulse response, we can calculate this frequency response uh, of the system. And uh, following the similar logic, we can also derive everything for discrete time system, discrete time LTI systems. But now, so we are looking at uh, all complex discrete time exponential signals taking this form. So Xn is z to the power of n. Here, the z can be any uh, complex number. And the uh, n, small n, uh, are the integers, time indexes. And then by the, again, by discrete convolution formula, the output, we can after some derivation, we can see the output is still the input scaled by a certain uh, response. And we can define this response as capital HZ. So this response only relies on your system impulse response, HK, and uh, the frequency Z. So we can evaluate this, once, once this impulse response is given, we can evaluate this response at any frequency Z. And then once we have these observations, we can look at the superpositions of these eigen signals. So, so basically if we consider uh, the input as a linear combination of these complex exponential signals. Now we know from the previous slides that each of these complex exponential is an eigen signal for LTI systems. So when we linearly combine them, due to the linearity of the system dropping, we know that corresponding output is the, the linear combination of all the individual outputs uh, corresponding to these complex exponential inputs. And for each of these complex exponential input, their output is given by the input scaled by a frequency response. And similarly, for the discrete system, we can we can have the same property. Uh, if the input is a linear combination of these eigen eigen signals, then the output is again a linear combination of the corresponding uh, responses. So why do we care about uh, this? such eigen signals and this linear combination. Well, this slice already tells us that um, if, we can, if we can express the input signal as a linear combination of these eigen signals, then analyzing 
understanding the corresponding output of this signal will be very simple. But you can see that uh, the output is basically a linear combination of the individual outputs uh, corresponding, to, corresponding to these eigen signals. So basically the key step is to uh, finding a way to rewrite or re express the input signal as a superposition of these eigen signals. And here I can start it to I can map these concepts into a geometric picture. And so so in the two D in the two D space. You can consider uh, two orthogonal and unit, uh, two orthogonal vectors, and both of them have unit depths. Now, these two vectors, U and V, forms a basis for the two dimensional space. So, if you pick any vector in this two dimensional space, and let's say this is X, well, we know that this X can be written as a linear combination of these two basis vectors. So let's call it, well, alpha, alpha u times u plus alpha v times v. And this is linear algebra. So first of all, we need to have, we need to introduce a basis a pair of basis uh, vectors or signals. So once we have this basis U and V, we can start it to ex uh, express the signal of interest under this basis by using the linear combination of these basis signals. So the first question, so there are several questions here. So first of all, how to First of all, we need to pick a basis. Like this U and V, you can pick this standard orthogonal basis, or you can pick any, you can rotate this pair of basis to, uh, to any angle, and this, they are still uh, a valid basis for the 2D plane. So depending on application, you need to determine which, which kind of basis to use. And then the second one is to, uh, compute compute the coordinate representations of your signal under this basis. And once you once given this U and V, then for any signal of interest X, you need to you need to uh, compute this their corresponding coordinates under this basis representations. Okay, now, now the first question is Now the first question is looking at this two dimensional example, uh, two dimensional example, we are not talking about signals here. Now in linear algebra, how do we compute alpha u and alpha v? Let's, let's say, you know, yeah, how do we compute this alpha? So given u, v, and x, how do we compute this alpha u and alpha v in linear algebra? Any comments?
there's a so basically you know we are we are given two linear equations here and we have two variables alpha u and alpha v they are two scalar uh, scalar variables but x u v they are two dimensional uh, vectors so we have two equations the first coordinate gives one equation second coordinate gives another equation we have two variables alpha u and alpha v and we have two equations so that can be used to uniquely determine these coefficients but intuitively it's very simple you just project let me do it make it shorter so that i can project it we just project x onto each of them and and the lens this lens is called alpha u and this is called alpha v alpha v and we just do a projection so in linear algebra this is called uh, the, the, the inner product or the dot product between x and your basis So this projection is basically the, taking the dot product between between your signal of interest and one of the bases. And mathemat mathematically, if we are given the coordinates of these vectors, that essentially means x i u i conjugate. Let's say we have p coordinates. So I, I add a conjugate. So I add a conjugate here because this this will make it work for compatible for complex uh, complex vectors. So it's more general. But you can see if, if you if we are talking about real uh, spaces, then this conjugate is essentially ui and vi. So this is basically the a standard inner product that we we learned in the linear algebra. So this is how we calculate the corresponding coefficients associated with associated with uh, each of the basis vector. So basically, okay, think about the big picture. You have a pair of bases U and V, and you have a signal of interest. If that's something object of interest X. So you want to you want to re represent X using this under this basis. So what you do, what do you do? You want to write x in terms of a linear combination of these bases. So the way you compute these coefficients alpha is to basically consider projecting the signal onto each of the bases. And in mathematics, this projection is, is defined through this inner product between these two vectors. Okay, so you compute summation x i u i conjugate. And this is intuitive because think about if I want to project the basis signal onto itself and find definition of this inner product that gives ui ui conjugate. But for complex, this, okay, this is where the conjugation really plays an important role. For complex, signals or for complex vectors. Uh, this is a complex number, complex number of to the conjugate. This equals to the magnitude of this complex number to the power of two. Right? Remember this formula. Ui Ui conjugate is the Ui magnitude 
to the power of two. And since UI is a, has a unit length, so this is one. And this means that when once, if we consider extreme case projecting the space the signal onto itself, then that coefficient is one. And it says u equals to one times u. This makes sense. But if we don't have this conjugation here, then we will not be able to get get rid of the complex part. So that's why this conjugation is very critical for complex vectors. So we have the question, why is this a summation? So this is basically a standard, right? So x is x1, x2, and u is u1, u2. Suppose they are in this two dimensional space and they have two coordinates. So in linear algebra, we define the uh, dot product by the you know, entry-wise product and then taking the summation. But this is the dot product definition. Okay. So, if we want to understand a signal under a certain basis, now there are two questions, right? How do we think, how, how do we pick up the basis? We may have infinitely many pairs of them. So the first question is that, uh, which basis should we consider? So different basis forms different types of representations of the signal. And then the second question is that, how do you compute the representation? representation of those signal in under such basis. And then going back to the slides, um, these equations on these slides tells us that in order to understand uh, LTS systems, it is very uh, it is very important to uh, trying to express our signals as T and in general signals. In terms of uh, the eigenfunctions, so here we are motivated to, to uh, form a basis using this eigenfunction. And these eigenfunctions takes very special form. They are exponential functions. So we can, so this motivates us to consider this. Let's see. Yeah, I think I can. So this motivates us to consider the following Fourier basis. So this T J omega T. So first of all, E J omega T is an uh, eigenfunction of the LTS system because we have now s is equals to j omega. So it takes exponential form. Now, more importantly, this by the Euler's formula, right, we can rewrite it into the real part and complex part. So basically, this basis has, has, uh, has a very good advantage in the sense that uh, essentially we are the basis that we are looking at is sinusoidal signals, cosine signal, sine signals. And we, for the real part, we use, we use cosine uh, signals to serve as the basis signal. And for the complex part, we use sine. So we know that both cosine and sine are very fundamental uh, signals. If we, so if we pick such a basis, uh, 
then we should be able to represent many sinusoidal like signals in a very compact way. And more importantly, later we will show that sine and cosine, they are orthogonal. So basically this basis has two sub basis that they are orthogonal to each other. So this makes, this allows us to handle complex part and the real imaginary part and real part simultaneously. Okay, so now let's, uh, so let's, okay. So let's go step by step. Um, so the first, so our first goal is to look at simpler signals, right? So here we are, we are trying to represent uh, any arbitrary signal in terms of a linear combination of these eigen signals. So first of all, we will we take a look at simple signals, uh, which is periodic signals. Periodic signals are simple because even they, the signals can last for infinity long time, but since they are periodic, so we only need to care about uh, one period of the signal. So these signals are, have a simpler structure. But the question, the key question that we want to answer is, can we represent periodic, the class of periodic signals uh, on, under these eigenfunctions, sinusoidal eigenfunction. So the answer is positive. Uh, we can we can represent any periodic signals xt uh, in terms of Fourier series. So let's let's look at this equation and try to connect this equation to the picture to the geometric that we have here. Um, so we are, first of all, we are talking about periodic signals. Okay, we will address the non aperiodic signals in the next lecture. So for periodic signals, um, this result shows that any periodic signal can be expanded in this way. It's an infinite uh, summation. Okay, so let's look at this uh, equations. For any periodic signals, xt, and uh, let's say the period is t, capital T naught. With that, this result says that we can rewrite, we can ex expand this periodic signal into this, in terms of this infinite summations. And if you look at this infinite summations, it is exactly a linear combination of this complex exponential basis, basis signals. Right, so this AK are the uh, linear combination coefficients and this exponential part are the basis signals. So you can imagine that we, we are looking at um, the basis signal, the collection of basis signals that we are looking at is e, e to the power of j k omega naught p, well k, and take any uh, integer values. So each of these bases is. Uh, 
depends on the delta frequency component omega naught. And this omega naught depends on the period of the underlying function, uh, underlying signal. So if your signal has a period capital P naught, then omega naught is two pi over capital T. And then we have we have a collection of such basis uh, complex exponential signals. So this result says that if your signal is periodic with period capital P naught, then it can be represented in this way. It can be represented under such a complex exponential basis. So we can decompose the signal XP uh, using this collection of complex exponential signals. And each of these complex exponentials basically sign cosine signals uh, by the Euler's formula. So essentially, we can decompose the signal, periodic signal, using sine and cosine signals. So now we have this. Uh, we have answered the first question. We have a basis for representing periodic signals. Now the basis is this complex exponential basis. So this is our basis. And the second question is how do we calculate? How do we calculate? Um, given this basis, given the signal, how do we calculate it? The coefficients a k and the calculation is very similar to what we have in the in this geometric picture. So we have that formula there. So it says a k is So the formula for calculating AK is this one. It's the integration, it's one over T naught integration over T naught. So basically this integration is uh, happening within one period of the signal. And this is intuitive because the signal is as a periodic structure. So we just need to focus on what anyone, any period of the signal. So it, within that integration, we're looking at if you look at the integration form, compare the integration formula with this inner product formula, they have very similar structures. If you can, you can understand summation as a kind of integration, right? The discrete case, continuous case. But if you look at the, the structure inside, uh, in the slides, it says xt times e to the power of negative j omega naught t. This is a, It'd be hard to understand. So if we rewrite it as the conjugate form, so this essentially is equivalent to xt times the conjugate of this complex basis, right? Because by the conjugation rule, this complex exponential to the conjugate is exactly you know, adding a negative sign to the base point. So they are equivalent. But if we write it in this conjugation form, then the meaning, the physical meaning is very clear. So this is exactly what we have in this uh, in this formula. Right? We have x is our signal of interest. Here u is the basis. Now here the this complex exponential is the basis. Therefore, this is this is essentially the inner product between x t and e j k w not t. Intuitively, you can say this is, you can understand this as a as kind of a dot product between your signal and each of your basis, complex exponential basis. 
So the picture is like you have the signal, you have the signal XT, uh, a periodic signal. But now you identified a collection of complex exponential bases. So all these U and Vs are these complex exponential signals. And then if you want to represent your periodic signal uh, under such a basis, now to calculate this representation coefficients, AK, you just do a projection. And mathematically, the projection is defined as you know, the inner product between your signal and the basis, which takes this mathematical formula. Okay, so I just want to tell you that this formula, they have a very simple and intuitive understanding. Uh, although they, this integration looks complicated, but each part is very intuitive. You have signal of interest, you have the basics. Now this conjugation is imposed by the inner, inner product in the complex case. Okay, so, so this formula for computing AK, basically it means that we are, we are projecting, it's kind of a projection of your signal onto each of the basics. And that projection, the value, the value of this projection gives you the, uh, the representation coefficient AK. So if you, if you accept this big picture, then everything uh, in the, in the follow-up lectures are very, Essentially, follow the same idea. So, and this is exactly how we understand uh, all types of transforms. Okay, what what does it? Why is it called a transform? It means that you are trans you are trying to understand the signal in a different uh, space under a different basis. So that is called a transform. You are, we are transforming the signal from the time domain to a frequency domain, and that precisely means that. Instead of looking at the time based basis, we are now looking at this complex exponential uh, functions as the basis. And this collection of complex exponential basis, they are indexed by k omega naught, right? So omega naught is you can understand it that it has the base uh, base frequency and k is any integer. So we are we are essentially decomposing the signal onto many different frequencies. So that's that's why we introduce the concept of frequency. It essentially means that these parameters are associated with the, your basis signals. So each basis signal is a sinusoidal signal. Right, the frequency is exactly k times omega naught, the radio frequency. So are there any questions for this picture? Uh, so with this picture, this formula is easy to understand. Right? Otherwise, it's very hard to um, understand why there's a negative sign uh, here. But this negative sign is actually conjugate, and the conjugate is involved in this inner product formula. So what we are essentially doing here is calculating the inner product, the dot product between your signal and this complex, complex exponential basis. So, you know, equivalently, equivalently, this is to say that XT Okay, so we are trying to, if you connect, if we connect these two pictures, these two lines of equations together, 
this is to say that Xt equals to a linear combination of this uh, convex exponential basis. And the coefficient is given by projecting Xt into this basis. Right. And then this is very, very, very intuitive to understand. And then, and then this projection, this in, this dot product is precisely defined as uh, we call this a k. It is defined as that integration. Okay, so, so this, the first formula is very, uh, very clear. We have decomposing signals on, under this exponential basis. And their representation coefficients is given by projecting signal onto each basis. That's it. So we all, all we need to do is to deal with this calculate this uh, dot product. And that is essentially calculate this integration. So everything again, everything is about integration calculus. <clears throat> so this slice is to uh, justify that this collection of bases they are orthogonal. Okay, in the sense that if you look at if you look at this result, the result shows that um, such an integration. Depending on the indexes k and l, they can be either zero or one. So this is exactly like our orthogonality problem uh, in the in the high dimensional space. So if we translate this into the dot product, if we translate this into the dot product language. This is to say that integral essentially. Is equivalent to the dot product between the first exponential basis and the second one. Now, the second one, remember, there's a conjugation there. So the actual basis is actually uh, involving that conjugation. Right. So this inner product is zero. So this shows that this connection of complex exponential basis signals, they are solved in this sense. If we are looking at if k equals to L, which means we are looking at the same basis uh, signals. And then this, this in the, this dot product is essentially you know, projecting this one of the basis onto itself. Which gives the value one, right? Because all the bases, you can imagine all, all the bases, they have a unit length. But otherwise, if you look at any any pair of different uh, basis signals, if k is not equal to l, then they are all orthogonal, meaning that they are dot product is zero. So this justifies that this is indeed a basis. A valid basis, but it's, it's very hard to imagine because now we have infinitely many of them and they are pairwise or subnet to each other. Okay. Right, so so this is the summary of the all the result that we have. So we can for any periodic signal xt, we can represent this represent the signal under 
such a complex complex exponential basis. And the way we calculate these coefficients is to basically project, is to calculate the dot product between the signal and that basis, and that basis signal. And this is to this is just to prove that prove prove this formula. Um, yeah, this is so this this part. What this part does is to let me see is to plug in x t into here. And then on the right hand side, you can you can see that that will give you the coefficient of k. So it's a short proof, and I will skip that. <laughs> and here are these are some copies of this. Uh, Presentation. So, so we are talking about in the previous slides, we are talking about periodic signals. And in general, these signals are complex. So, again, like X can be complex value. So, when you calculate this AK, they can, in general, they are complex. These coefficients are complex numbers. But the, uh, the first property says that if your signal happened to be real value, if your signal is a real value signal, then uh, those coefficients satisfy uh, this property. So they are conjugate symmetric. But if you go back to the, if you go back to this representation, uh, Go back to this representation. Uh, so what this equation says that says is that x t any periodic signal x t can be uniquely represented by uh, all these coefficients a k because because all these bases they are fixed. But they apply to any periodic uh, signal. So all we need to know is this uh, compact representation AK. So this is A0, A, A1, A91, A2, 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 A2. And the problem says that if xt is real valued, Then, if you look at a k and a negative k, they are conjugate to each other. So we can we call this a k the spectrum of this signal, right? Because these are the representations under the frequent all these uh, Fourier, no, all these exponential signals. And each exponential, complex exponential, has its unique frequency. So, if, so this is this generates a spectrum representation of the signal. And and this probably says that if the signal is real value, then the spectrum is conjugate symmetric. If you look at spectrum in the positive part, um, they are conjugate to the spectrum of the negative part. So they have the same magnitude. If you draw the uh, if you draw the magnitude map of the spectrum, then it's symmetric, but the phase will be reversed because of the conjugation. So this is for real value signals. And moreover, because now under this case, we can 
we can rewrite, we can further simplify the, this complex, this Fourier expansion into, into uh, the cosine form. Okay. So, it's basically, so basically this is the original uh, expansion. And then we will write the summation uh, into this one. This is equivalent because we have a zeros term and k, k from one to infinity. We have a k here, and the a nephi k will corresponds to nephi one to nephi infinity. So it's basically a, a thick set, uh, dividing the entire summation into three parts: a zero, a k, and a nephi k. And then because if, if f is real, then a nephi k is a conjugate of a k. So, so this one becomes the conjugation of a k. And then you can see that this part is exactly the conjugate of this part, right? Because a k, a k conjugate, and the exponential part is also conjugate. So this, the entire part, they are conjugate to each other. And then by the conjugation property, we can we can see that if you're adding up two complex numbers that are conjugate with each other, uh, the real, the imaginary part cancels. So the real part, only the real part is preserved. And there's a coefficient of two because the real parts are the same. So essentially for periodic real value functions, it can be, it is essentially uh, a linear combination of cosine signals. And <clears throat> the last five minutes we can, yeah, we can, we can quickly go over this example. So we want to express XT um, okay, given xt as a sine signal, sine omega naught t, we want to find out, uh, we want to express, find out the Fourier series, the corresponding Fourier series. So for this one, there are two approaches, right? You, first of all, you can, you can follow, follow this formula. Now, now xt is given as sine omega of t. So plug it in, calculate this integration, obtain this ak. Once you have the ak, you have this Fourier series. So the key is to calculate this ak. But in this case, it's actually uh, for this simple signals, it's actually easier. So we can directly uh, leverage in the inverse Euler's formula. By the inverse Euler's formula, we know that sine omega naught t can be written in into a summation of two complex exponentials, <clears throat> and then this already gives you the Fourier series, because if you compare this with the uh, with the Fourier series, right here we have a summation of infinite terms. But, the, but by the inverse Euler's formula, it directly tells us that this sign signal can only de decompose into two complex, a, a linear combination of two complex, complex exponentials. So by comparison, we can identify that we only have a1 and a negative one, and their corresponding coefficient is given by uh, these two. Right, so this is the coefficient, and this exponential part is the basis part. Right, so the basis are to the power of j k omega naught t. So for this one, it corresponds to k equals to one, right? Because it's j omega naught t. So that's why we, we we can tell that this this coefficient is exactly a one. And similarly, for the other one, this, this basis corresponds to k equals to negative one. 
Therefore, the corresponding coefficient negative one over two j is a negative one. And since we only have these two terms, that means all the other a k's are zero. Okay, so this is a trick. This is a trick that you can play for this simple sinusoidal sequence directly by following the Euler's formula. But if you follow the standard approach, follow that uh, integration formula, you can you can also obtain the same result. And uh, this the, the second example is exactly following the same idea. We have uh, X is given as this combination of sine cosine signals. For each of them, we use the inverse Euler's formula to decompose them into a pair of complex exponentials. And then by, by simplifying, rearranging everything a little bit. So in the end, we can rewrite it into this standard form. Well, you can easily tell that these are the standard basis, uh, basis signals. And therefore, their corresponding coefficients are the corresponding a case. So by comparing by comparing this with the uh, Fourier series, we, we can identify this a case. So this, so for this signal, we have five, uh, one, two, three, five non-zero a case, and all the other a case are zero. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so I think I will stop here. Uh, so in the next lecture, we will go over this uh, practical example where we need to leverage that integration formula to calculate uh, the values for the case. But it's in the end, so everything is calculated. So make sure you are comfortable with uh, doing this integration. Okay, I think I will stop here. Yes, so uh, you can come to my personal Zoom meeting and we can have a... Yeah, you can come to my, come to my personal Zoom meeting. Uh, I will connect it to the Zoom meeting like uh, around two o'clock. Okay, I'll see you guys uh, next next Tuesday. Thank you.